So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our session today. Uh, today we'll be having uh, a CME webinar on updates on management of hypertension with Dr. JC Goldman. Uh, it's an honor to have uh, all of you here. Uh, so I will get started with uh, a little bit introduction to it in our game to what we do in general. So, uh, <clears throat> Yet in our is a volunteer network of healthcare professionals. Currently, uh, we have volunteers from all over the world. Our license is based on uh, Philadelphia, actually. We still uh, are working on to get the license here. Uh, we have volunteers from medical professionals, web designers, and, uh, and medical students, a large variety of uh, disciplines as well. So uh, currently, we work on uh, many wings like health promotion, health advocacy, uh, community outreach, mentorship, CME, and research and QA projects. So uh, on health promotion, we have uh, article writing competition. We actually finished uh, one yesterday. We had a competition from many applicants and top 10 applicants were rewarded yesterday in collaboration with Roha and uh, Minister of Health of Ethiopia. We also have podcasts. So we have published around 38 episodes and you can find our episodes on uh, Spotify, uh, Google Podcast, and uh, Taraki app as well. Uh, we also have uh, weekly club dis uh, clubhouse discussions. On these discussions, we have a, a number of disciplinary uh, specialists and from many uh, medical parts. So what we do here is we have uh, experienced people and we put them uh, directly in contact with the large community. So here, anyone can attend. It's not just medical professionals, uh, common cases or uh, confusions that are in the medical <coughs> departments are raised so uh, regarding that you can also attend our clubhouse discussions weekly uh, on health advocacy on mental health uh, we are currently doing campaigns on cancer care we have also had disability inclusion trainings we have given uh, sign language training for medical professionals we have also given SRHR uh, training to the disabled community so uh, we also have a community outreach uh, program uh, we have blood donation campaigns and the like. Uh, on our mentorship program, uh, we have around 400 mentees still now uh, with 100 mentors. So what we do is we pair medical students and medical professionals of various fields with specialists and people outside and inside in the country who are exhaling at, at their field. So what we do is we pair these medical students and medical professionals with the mentors they are interested in in the field. So they would have a one year program of mentorship at the end we will uh, certify both so uh, the other CME is what we are doing right now so last year we had around 36 sessions to this year we're planning around 50 so uh, what we do here is uh, we will bring medical professionals and uh, on their specific specialty so we will pick a specific topic that will be uh, we think is useful for the medical professionals so Medical professionals can join, and after the training, they would get their same <clears throat> uh, certified CU with CU points. Uh, the last but the not least is the research and QI project. Uh, our CMEs are uh, organized with EMA, ASCP, and EVS, uh, and we're trying to add so many other associations and societies uh, to our stakeholders. So, if you want to get an uh, update on our uh, upcoming CMEs, you can uh, join our Telegram channel or follow us on social media. We are available on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Uh, we will uh, post the link tree shortly. So there you can find the link to anything you want. Uh, the Another one is our research uh, fellowship program with Roha. Uh, to say a little bit about that, uh, we're currently, we have already started. We're doing it with Addis Ababa University Medical Faculty and St. Paul's Hospital. So here uh, with Addis Ababa, we're actually including three departments, oncology, radiology, and internal medicine. So uh, research proposals will be submitted and the top three winners will get research grants and the top 10 will get mentorship uh, on their research. Uh, on as well, uh, in, in St. Paul, we're doing with medical students. So the call out has been sent this week. Uh, so the medical interns will propose their, they will submit their proposals and research grant will be given for two winners as well. Uh, the other one was the health writing article competition. So we just finished that uh, last week. You can check more on that on our Twitter page. 
Uh, with that being said, uh, I will just uh, leave you with a few points for best experience in this webinar. So uh, if you have any question and answers during the seminar, you can send us on the Q&A box. And after the end of the session, we'll present them to Dr. Jesse Goldman and he will elaborate on that. Uh, to get your CEV certificates, you must fill the, uh, the following criteria. So one is you have to attend the whole session. Uh, we will check meets attended are checked by Zoom attendee reports. The other one is you will have a Google form for personal details and attendance. Another one is we will have a post webinar quiz and you will have to score 50% or above on that. Uh, you will not get the certificates right away. You will get the results, but the certificates might take one to two weeks as our uh, stakeholders will take some time to issue it. Uh, if you have any issue during that time, you can also email us. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Zoom, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Israfil, for allowing me to introduce Dr. Jesse Goldman, who I'm lucky to call a colleague. Uh, Dr. Jesse Goldman is a renowned nephrologist and an expert in hypertension who will be delivering our CME session today. This session is, uh, will be delivered in collaboration with the Atenawag and Ethiopia Society of Cardiology Professionals who will be delivering your CME. Dr. Goldman has been a practicing nephrologist since 1991, and he's a board certified in medicine and nephrology. He received his undergraduate degree from New York University and his medical degree from the New York Medical College. He completed his renal fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. Currently, Dr. Goldman serves as a clinical professor of medicine at Thomas Jefferson University and is a fellow of the American Society of Nephrology and the American Heart Association. He's been a part of the steering committee for the Delaware Valley Hypertension Society and was a former chairman of the Biomedical Research and Institutional Review Board at Drexel University. Dr. Goldman has authored numerous peer-reviewed publications and book chapters on hypertension and has been a clinical investigator on more than the 20 investigator-initiated and clinical trials in hypertension, has also trained more than 100 nephrology fellows, one of them being me, during his career, with extensive experience and expertise in hypertension, Dr. Goldman is sure to provide us a valuable insight during uh, our online CME session today. Please join me in welcoming him as our distinguished speaker for this event. Thank you. Jesse, you okay? And we're getting there. Okay, okay, perfect. You guys can see the screen, okay? Uh, yes. Great, thank you. So, welcome everyone. I want to really thank uh, you, Dr. Helmerium, and. And Dr. Soon to be Dr. Ali for uh, inviting me to give this presentation on hypertension uh, that I've been uh, involved in studying for um, and speaking about for uh, for many years. I'm very interested in hypertension, <clears throat> as you all know, because it it predicts <clears throat> excuse me it predicts so many other. Um, medical illnesses, stroke, heart attack, kidney failure, dementia. So it's striking at the weeds. I've never, and as all you'll know, it's a global problem uh, here in the United States, as well as in Ethiopia. I've, I've never been to Ethiopia, but I certainly hope to someday. So I'm hopeful that I can go with uh, Fitzum. And, uh, and by the way, he was an excellent renal fellow. Um, so with that said, you know, I have a little cartoon at the beginning where it says, give it to me straight, doc. How long do I have to ignore your advice? And I highlight this because I do think that hypertension is, it's certainly got a very rich and robust um, medical physiology, but it's, it's also certainly a social disease, social as in you know, we, we know a lot about treating hypertension, about causes of hypertension, and yet rates of control remain elusive. 
So the, I'd like to, over the next hour, I'd like to take you through these different topics that I think were really quite varied. Um, some you've seen before, some will be fairly new and innovative. I do have four CME questions at the end, and I'll do my best to highlight those questions so that everyone can get 100 on the exam and get CME credit. So uh, this is an older slide from the US talking about how the poor rates of control um, have been through the United States. Um, you know, the N. Haynes National Health and Nutrition Survey, people would go into the community in different phases and waves and monitor both the awareness, treatment and control this is a fairly old slide, um, and mo everything I think is newer than this, but as recently as about 20 years ago, hypertension rates, even in the United States, were terrible. Um, things have improved somewhat in the US over the succeeding 20, 25 years, but we're still far from perfect. Um, Initially on the left, you see there was an attempt to, in 2020, there was an attempt to stratify hypertension by race. Um, but thankfully we've moved away from race models and more towards socioeconomic models. So that on the right panel, you can see that with increasing socioeconomic status, rates of control improve. So it's not so much about race, it's more about um, access to care uh, and access to medication and awareness. So to be, so that's uh, epidemiology. To get to jump to something really quite practical, I want to, you know, we're all, many of us are practicing physicians here. So it doesn't help for me to give you, uh, certainly theory is interesting, but I, as a speaker, I do tend to highlight what's practical and things you can take with you to the office to improve your better blood pressure control. So these are things that Dr. Helmerium and I uh, look at you know, day in and day out. Is the patient measuring blood pressure properly? Um, do they have, uh, are they sitting, are they not talking during the measurement? Are they waiting two minutes? Does the cuff fit properly? I'm gonna talk a lot more about sodium intake later because I think that this is a, it's a global issue. And I'll show you some, some really interesting recent data that sodium it certainly is related to blood pressure control rates, but to overall vascular health as well. Diuretic therapy and inadequate diuretic therapy, either because of non-adherence or because of low dose is quite common. Poorly, so poor choices of medications with too low a dose or some medications that work that compete with the effect of your antihypertensive meds. I don't know how big a problem it is in Ethiopia, but in the United States, alcohol use is certainly an issue. And certainly looking for identifiable causes of hypertension, specifically chronic kidney disease, obesity, um, uh, stress in people's lives are all common identifiable causes of hypertension. So I did a little bit of background research and you know the the guidelines for blood pressure control are a little different in Ethiopia as compared to the United States. Um, I think the at least the Ethiopian guidelines recommend, and I didn't, I don't want to bring Coles to Newcastle and show you guys your own hypertension guidelines, but I believe the, the, often many physicians are following the European guidelines. Um, most of the global guidelines agree um, in Canada, England, US, there is some variation among the European guidelines where with the American guidelines shooting, as you can see, for 
slightly lower blood pressures, defining perfect blood pressure as less than 120. Now, I want to tell you, in, in my real life, I think that's rarely achievable. Um, but it's partly because I'm treating a CKD population. Whereas we have this very ambitious goal in the US of an elevated blood pressure. And you know, it really might sound um, surprising that even a systolic blood pressure of 121 or 122 might be considered abnormal. And then with this stage two hypertension that used to be the th at a systolic of 140, remember this used to be the threshold for causing calling stage one hypertension. So recently over the last several years, the American guidelines have aimed for tighter control. I'll show you why that is um, in a moment. Um, but I do wanna take just a moment to define some terms. I promised you that there would be a hint about something about CME questions. So I would pay a little bit of extra attention here. I know you're all paying close attention, but the definition of resistant hypertension is inadequate control on three or more drugs, one of which is a diuretic of different classes at different of different uh, at, at adequate doses, whatever adequate doses mean. There's a term of apparent resistant hypertension, which means that they they're, um, they meet the criteria for resistance, but we don't know if they're adherent. So if you if they might be um, resistant or they might be um, non-adherent, we call them apparent resistant until we clarify that condition. Pseudo resistance is a nice way of saying non-compliant. And I was involved in a renal denervation trial where we were zapping the nerves in renal arteries of people with resistant hypertension. But in order to part in order to enroll in the study, patients had to be, we were monitoring their drug adherence by giving them a triple combo pill. And 50% of people who swore um, that they never miss a dose of medication when they were switched to a triple combination pill were no longer hypertensive. So the sweetest little old ladies are trying to doctor please and tell you that they're adherent. And some of them are telling the truth and some maybe are not so much. White coat hypertension, Remember the, God, the recommendations for home blood pressure have not caught up with the American Heart Association guidelines. So we call white coat hypertension if your blood pressure is high in the office um, and yet less than 135 over 85 by home monitoring. Mast hypertension is the opposite of white coat hypertension. And it's where the blood pressure is actually normal in the office, but elevated at home. Whereas white coat hypertension does not seem to be associated with increased cardiovascular risk. Interestingly, mast hypertension does seem to be associated with elevated hypertension risk. And I saw a patient like this in the office really just a couple of days ago where they, they're doing home blood pressure monitoring in the office. It was fine, systolic 118. And yet the patient tells me, you know, at home, I'm always getting 140, 140s. So we talked about proper blood pressure measurement. We may be able to do some ambulatory blood pressure measurement, but uh, this, this entity really does exist. It's not rare but it's a little bit difficult to detect. Dipping blood pressure is the normal fall in blood pressure that occurs at night, it's supposed to be greater than 10%. People who are non-dippers, who blood pressures actually rise at night, classically people with chronic kidney disease are non-dippers. So these patients do tend to have elevated blood pressure day and night. And again, you can only detect this by ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. You can't really have people wake up 
as, and to go to sleep with a blood pressure monitor. And finally, refractory hypertension is a very ch challenging entity. These are people who are not at target blood pressure on five or more antihypertensive medications. And they're harder to find, but these people do seem to have increased sympathetic tone. But uh, these are the people who get referred to hypertension specialists. Uh, they really can be very, they get an evaluation for secondary causes, can be quite challenging to find. So why are the American guidelines targeting a systolic blood pressure that's now so low? Remember, it led to the reclassification of many people who were thought to not be hypertensive. Now, if, when your systolic is 128, now you're called hypertensive, where for years these patients were told they're not. So really overnight, many millions of people uh, were reclassified as hypertensive. But it's because of this trial, the SPRINT trial, published in the New England Journal of Medicine coming up to 10 years ago, I guess eight years ago, where almost 10,000 people were randomized to targets of less than systolic 120 or greater than 120. And they looked at a composite endpoint of time to first MI, coronary syndrome, CVA, or heart failure or death. They did get good separation in the groups, as you can see, with mean blood pressure differences of 121 versus 134. And in terms of the outcomes on the left, the, the study was actually prematurely terminated because the people in the intensive blood pressure group had so much better outcomes than people who, with that is with a systolic randomized to try to get below 120 versus people who were randomized to try to get below 140. In Sprint, they used fair, a, a fairly sophisticated device, this Omron automatic blood pressure monitor that uh, tries to remove a white coat effect. It, that even among people who don't have classic white coat hypertension, there is a white coat effect that being in the doctor's office does raise blood pressure. On the right, you can see that the mortality difference was improved with intensive blood pressure control as well. And this well-done study was very motivating for the American Heart Association and those writing guidelines to target lower blood pressures, especially in people who were at increased risk. Um, the when on subgroup analysis, you know whether or not it was chronic kidney disease, older people, younger people, men, women, racial differences, prior cardiovascular disease. It really didn't matter that the if you're if that black um, square fell to the left of the solid vertical line, those groups did better with lower blood pressure targets. So, um, you know, there, there had been resistance or some inertia to try to get to lower blood pressure targets for fear that people would become dizzy and develop syncope and lightheadedness, that people who were more frail and older might not tolerate it. But, um, you know, that's why it's called research because in all of these groups, most people did better at lower blood pressure targets. So again, practically, even if I can't get people down below in their 120s, I'm certainly trying to get them closer to 130 than I am leaving them in the low 140 range and saying that you're probably good enough. So now that I've spent some effort to try to uh, uh, suggest to you or convince many of you that lower blood pressure targets are better, I'm going to present something slightly different, which is this 25-year-old man, non-smoker with a BMI of 25, a good cholesterol, 
and yet the blood pressure was elevated at 150 over 90 for three minutes, excuse me, for three months, and no, no family, or there, rather, there is a family history of hypertension, no end organ damage. This patient did have an echocardiogram that showed no left ventricular hypertrophy. Fundoscopy was normal. They denied any substances. And the blood pressures are the same at home, whether or not it's in the office trying to exclude a white coat effect. So this person has persistently elevated blood pressure, but fairly low risk, being young, not diabetic, no left ventricular hypertrophy. And the question is, should I treat this person? I know if I, when I ask my colleagues this, and I believe if I opened it up to a discussion, we would get lots of um, opinions. So it's a question mark. The American College of Cardiology does have an, uh, an atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk assessment tool and I entered the data, and you can Google this. It's easy enough to find it. It's a free site. For this person, I, can, I put in, it's a man. This person was white. I put in their blood pressure, their current age, their cholesterol, that they did not have diabetes, a family history, or they are not on a statin, not taking aspirin. And you can see that this person's, even at a 40-year-old, remember our, our uh, patient here was 25. This patient's 10-year risk of a cardiovascular risk event, rather, is only 1.5%. His lifetime risk is certainly higher at 46%, but right now, it, you really can watch and wait on this 25-year-old to see what happens, because their risk of having an event is quite low. Now, they do have the caveats. What do you do when you're evaluating a person who's so young because they only have data between the ages of 40 to 79? So I did want, for the sake of our talk, I did want to magnify the disclaimer here that the lifetime risk, we do put in 40 years old, but you can see that probably the risk of a 25-year-old would be even lower but to, to be able to use this web tool, 40 is the lowest cutoff. So they do have the distinction that younger people, we don't really know if there's a difference between 25 year olds and 40 year olds. So in terms I did, so uh, continuing on with our, our uh, topic, our tour of hypertension, many patients ask me, what, what can I eat? to bring down my blood pressure and avoid medication. But there's been something called a DASH diet that's been in existence for many years. And even after, even though DASH has been around for many years, it's similar to a Mediterranean diet. It stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And essentially it's a diet that's um, high in potassium, low in saturated fats, and low in, in animal protein. Um, as I mentioned, many people think that a DASH diet um, just means low sodium diet. But in this data here, I wanna show you that a low sodium diet is additive to a DASH diet. So in the left panel, you know, we can see that people here who start on nothing, even on a high sodium diet, if you add a, if you added this broccoli is meant to be a, a DASH diet, blood pressure falls in all the groups. And it's, there's an additive blood pressure lowering. If you combine a diet that's rich in potassium and low in saturated fats with a low sodium diet. Um, again, if you were to enter the National Kidney Foundation, you'd be able to, or the American Heart Association, you can easily Google a PDF for the DASH diet. It's in English, uh, I don't, and it's in some languages. I've seen it in Spanish, in Chinese. I don't know if it, it's available in Arabic or not. Um, I would also mention that, you know, it because it, it, patients find it difficult to maintain a DASH diet all the time. 
But even we call it half a dash, even getting there halfway does seem to lead to improved blood pressure events. So even though, you know, the patients don't need to get, um, uh, you know, they don't, they shouldn't give up if they can't adhere to a full DASH diet, even increasing any fruits and vegetables with any decrease in animal protein does seem to lead to improved blood pressure control. Um, so I, I, uh, I did throw in here really something I read just recently that was really quite interesting, and I haven't presented this data before, but this is really the very intriguing data published just a few months ago in Lancet that a serum sodium level is associated with cardio with markers of aging as well as mortality. So remember that a sodium level is not directly related to um, sodium intake, but uh, it's really something that I had never attended to before. And because we were talking about sodium, I did want to sort of bring out this really very intriguing idea that they, this is a retrospective database study looking at almost 16,000 people in the U.S. between the ages of 44 and 66. These patients were followed for 25 years. They signed up decades ago to be subjects. And then this particular group, they, they collected data over time. And this group created a composite endpoint of vascular aging. It's sort of, you know, it's sort of a biochemical combination of things we could agree or disagree on what belongs in there. But they looked at blood pressure, GFR, uh, changes in BUN, systolic blood pressure, hemoglobin A1C, all these over time. And uh, they first in the text, you can see they found that people who had higher serum sodiums above 140 had higher cardiovascular risk, more chronic diseases. And people who had serum sodiums above 144 even had a 20% elevated risk of mortality. And that people who had serum sodiums greater than 142 seem to be at greater than 50% heart, uh, higher odds risk of having this higher chronological age. So you can see from that little three-dimensional image in the lower right corner that on the x-axis going to the left is increasing age and the y-axis with going to the right is increasing sodium, and on the z-axis vertically um, is biological age, so chronological age versus uh, versus uh, biological age, and you can see that this three-dimensional shape, as the serum for any given um, chronological age, that as uh, the serum sodium rises. The, the, the biologic age, meaning the, uh, the signs that your vessels are wearing out or becoming, your, your vessels are looking more like that of an older person are increasing. So um, I, don't, I don't really know what to make of it, uh, but certainly it's related to, there is, there is some weak relationship between overall sodium intake and serum sodium levels. So I'm sort of planting a seed with you guys. It's controversial, it's new, but uh, I thought it was exciting enough for me to share it with you. That was more theoretical. Let's transition back to uh, something really very practical. You're seeing someone in the office. What medications should I start first in a patient who we think is hypertensive, who is at increased cardiovascular risk, do I give them a thiazide, a diuretic, a calcium channel blocker, an ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker? I think often having talked to many physicians over the years, doctors tend to be creatures of habit. We look at the ceiling and choose our favorite antihypertensive meds. 
certainly if a person has a, you know, an indication like being a diabetic, people are good at remembering choose an ACE inhibitor. If, uh, if they're fluid overloaded, diuretics, but when there's nothing leading, we really don't know what to choose. Um, I think people have started to forget the All Hat trial, the world's largest prospective blood pressure trial where um, nearly 100,000 patients were randomized to a diuretic, a calcium channel blocker, an ACE inhibitor, or a centrally acting agent that doesn't show up here, doxazosin. The doxazosin limb was terminated because of more heart failure. So in the final publications, again, more than 20 years ago, they saw that chlorthalidone, amlodipine, and lisinopril all had about the same overall cardiovascular event rate. And yet, I do put the panel on the right that among African Americans, there seemed to be less stroke in people who got chlorthalidone. So um, this is just playing the odds. So I do tend to choose, but the, the purpose of this was to show that diuretics are still really tried and true antihypertensive medications. Um, why are diuretics so effective, even in people with lots of medical problems? Well, here's a sort of a schematic table where on the x-axis, we have increasing mean arterial blood pressure, and on the y-axis, increased urinary sodium. And we know that if people are who are young and lean, like uh, Israfil here, um, they can eat as much sodium as they like. You know, this, this bar, the green line stays vertical. Blood pressure really doesn't rise. But as people get older, as their body mass index goes up, as GFR rises, people develop sodium sensitivity. So with increasing age, with increasing body mass index, uh, decreasing GFR, for any increase in dietary sodium, you do get an increased uh, elevation in blood pressure. So I do want to highlight the idea that sodium doesn't seem to cause hypertension, but among people with hypertension, the majority of people, more than 70 to 80 percent, are salt sensitive and with increasing salt intake do have higher blood pressure. This does seem to be true, as I mentioned, for chronic kidney disease, but also for increasing age, increasing body mass index. Um, all of these uh, conditions do seem to be associated with the develop with a progressive development of salt sensitivity. Now, when I some patients tr don't want to take a diuretic. Uh, they complain either of incontinence, and I do try to get people, those can be challenging, but many people, especially uh, older people, tell me that they have to get up many times at night to use the bathroom uh, because they're, they, they attribute it to taking a diuretic. Um, it is true that in the setting of elevated blood pressure, that there is decreased reabsorption of sodium in the nephron. And you can see here about de this decreased proximal tubule sodium reabsorption, about 40% more increased volume delivered to the distal tubule. Um, so first, the obvious thing, I tell people don't take the diuretic right before bed. Don't drink a lot of water, you know, in the nighttime hours. Um, but over and above that, I try to make the case that if we get the blood pressure down, that they that they oddly their urine frequency will will decrease, and it's been termed a pressure naturesis. Again, there's a hint here for the CME portion of our exam, the idea that so patient you may see someone with a systolic blood pressure of 160 and they say they don't want to take a diuretic, but if you can get them to salt limit and to take the diuretic that as blood pressure improves, 
their nocturnal urinary frequency actually improves, decreases. Um, I would say again that I, I do make the point for patients that if they're continuing to eat sodium, high sodium diet, that the diuretic will not be effective. So they really have to combine low sodium intake with the use of the diuretics. Uh, other things that will help you achieve blood pressure targets are avoiding frequent medication. So we, it's very clearly known that once a day or twice a day, dosing of antihypertensives leads to much better adherence. And again, there was a, a, a beautiful study done in Canada uh, several years ago where they took either gave people either a diuretic, uh, a diuretic and an ACE inhibitor in two different pills versus a combination pill at one a day and showed that the exact same doses led to, but when given in one pill, led to better achieving blood pressure targets. So um, again, adherence is, uh, is, is really very important. We all know about the effect of half-life. And I think this is a, a nice play to, to sort of highlight that, you know, doctors are very smart people, but sometimes we have trouble translating what we know into what we practice. So I have here two tables of the angiotensin receptor blockers and ACE inhibitors. Um, you know, I'm old enough that I, I remember when Captopril would be used frequently for treatment of hypertension, the first clinically available ACE inhibitor. And no one uses captopril anymore because its half-life is so short. And yet I see, I, don't, I can't speak for what happens in other countries, but I do know that I, even in the US, I see many physicians who have, who have inertia and prescribe Losartan also that has a very short half-life. And to me, the only explanation is the sort of um, patterns and uh, you know complacency with feeling comfortable using this medication, where it's both of these medicines are um, far and away have very short half lives and wear off quite quickly. You don't have to believe me. You can look at Wikipedia when you enter low sartan. I think even as a, I looked at showed this to a medical student just a few days ago. After I saw, after we had seen three or four people still on Losartan, um, that the elimination half-life of Losartan is still only one and a half to two hours. So I do a lot of what I do in hypertension clinic is often try to move people onto longer half-life medications. <clears throat> Just a word about and one last word about choosing, might be a couple more words about choosing antihypertensive medications. <clears throat> For those of you who have access to plasma renin activities, so let's just think about this for a moment. In people who are volume overloaded, renin levels go down because the angiotensin II levels are turned off and aldosterone levels are turned off. So it's been known for decades, uh, even by, it's been sort of spearheaded by John Lara, one of the pioneers of hypertension in, in the US, where they put renin on the map. Um, we found that when you don't know what to choose, if you measure a renin level and it's low, that these patients who have low renin levels are essentially act as though they're volume overloaded and they respond better to diuretics. So Dr. Lara termed these patients V, V for volume patients. Whereas if the plasma renin or PRA level was elevated, these patients would not respond well to diuretics and they might do better with giving a, a RAS blocker, something that blocks renin angiotensin system like, um, like an ACE inhibitor. So 
Um, if you're not sure what to choose and you really, uh, you, you could, um, if you have the time and access to a plasma renin activity, I know this is sort of a complex idea, but I'm not saying you need to do this for everyone. But if you're not sure and you suspect that the patient may have uh, salt sensitive hypertension, you could check a renin level. And if it's low, you'd be, uh, you'd now have some evidence that they would do better with a diuretic. So, um, so that's some guidance rather than just looking at the ceiling and choosing your favorite medication. Uh, my brother is a cardiologist, so we all know that cardiologists love beta blockers. And beta blockers are great in heart failure. They're great post-MI. But I want to show you here, these are results of several trials that beta blockers should not be first-line treatment for the management of hypertension. Aside from the fact that they're poorly tolerated, especially in young men, you do not seem to prevent stroke or, interest surprisingly, you don't prevent myocardial infarction. So in Life Trial and ASCOT, we know that the slower the heart rate on beta blocker in clinical trials, these patients had more cardiovascular events. So I do believe in using beta blockers when I'm struggling after the patient's not controlled on three or four meds. It certainly, if they're tachycardic, I'll use a beta blocker, but it, they really should not be first line or even second line treatments for management of just straight hypertension. So in the United States, there's a large health maintenance organization in California on the West Coast called Kaiser Permanente, and they control um, the care for millions of patients out there on the West Coast, and they try to streamline management of hypertension. So what did they do in 1999? They created a task force and tried to create algorithms and this is the highlight from their publication. It's really quite dramatic. This is sort of related to that um, choice of R drugs versus V drugs, that is the ACE inhibitors or the diuretics. They made their approach was, I'm not going to try to check a renin level. I'm just going to treat both. And with the approach I'm going to show you, they achieved the fairly remarkable improvement from 44% up to 90% blood pressure control in 13 years. So I don't want you to think it's just choice of a medication. They also had nurses and uh, you know, following up with patients and calling them, having them check blood pressures at home. It was more than just choosing a med, but I think we'd all agree that this is a fairly dramatic improvement in a large population of hypertensives. So what did they do? They used a combination pill. Um, if you had mild hypertension, they gave you half a pill a day of 20 slash 25. If you had moderate hypertension, you got a full pill. And if you were severely hypertensive, you got one twice a day. So it was choice of medications was taken away and it was the same fixed combination. And they really only controlled uh, how much of that tablet to take depending upon the severity of your hypertension. What if you still weren't controlled in round two? Well, then these people had a long acting calcium channel blocker added with increasing doses. And if they meant to went to round three, still not controlled on a high dose um, lisinopril hydrochlorothiazide with high dose amlodipine at 10 milligrams. Then finally, there was a choice of either spironolactone, which certainly should be everyone's go-to drug for resistant hypertension, or a beta blocker when people could not take an ACE inhibitor, excuse me, a, a, an, a, an, a, an ALDO antagonist because of renal insufficiency or hyperkalemia. 
So that was their approach with nursing follow-up and call, how they moved the needle from 44% to 90%. This hasn't caught on nationally, but it's really out there. And it's a nice sort of standardized approach if you need a template about where to start. Uh, here in the US, obesity is a fairly common cause of resistant hypertension. I'm not going to go into all the specifics, but there have been increasing number of medications, whether or not it's metformin or semaglutide um, or even fentiramine to control blood, uh, to control weight, because this, in, at least in my population, this is probably the most common secondary cause of hypertension, where I'm often struggling to get their blood pressures down in people with body mass indices in the 40s. Um, I do have some patients who are on many medications and just can't bear to take uh, any more pills. Here's a 65-year-old woman who's on uh, you know, 12 tablets a day still with inadequate blood pressure control. Um, she's getting a good dose of diuretics. She has renal insufficiency. Again, I think Dr. Halimerian would agree that uh, for, for us, the most after obesity, chronic kidney disease, especially at the more advanced stages of 3B or higher, is often associated with resistant hypertension. What do I do for these patients? I give them a clonidine patch. Patients like it because it's not another pill. I like it because it has very few side effects, certainly very fewer side effects than oral clonidine that causes a lot of sedation uh, as well as uh, dry mouth. Clon the other nice thing about clonidine is it gives me insight into the patient's adherence. If they come into the office and the patch isn't on, I can pretty much know that they're probably not taking many of the other medications, regardless of what they're telling me. Um, fairly obvious here, frequency of hypertension visits matters. No surprise that if you, if you make an adjustment in the patient's medication and don't bring them back for six months, your chances of moving the needle, getting their blood pressure better is lower. It may seem like a bit of a waste of time to bring in hypertensive people every month or so just to check blood pressure, but you may be able to get them checked by your office staff, even if you're not available. So more frequent checks, enrolling patients, enrolling family members to check blood pressures. All of these things lead to better blood pressure control. It's not exciting like choosing or measuring renin levels or choosing uh, obscure medications like uh, spironolactone. But if your goal is to get better control, sometimes you know, even though my office is jammed, I will bring people in in a few weeks just for a blood pressure check to, to, because I don't wanna wait three or four months before we've made another move. Um, adherence is a big issue. I try not to only blame, not to blame patients, but I think it's half physician, half uh, patients. So I would resist in the title here asking questions like, you take all of your medications right, because patients will always say right. Instead, I say, what are you taking? Um, and then if they don't know the names of their medications, I can be fairly sure that they're not really even taking them. But there is for you do more. Not, this is not something I do regularly, but there are formal medication adherence scales where you, people get to answer in the office on paper um, to try to get at, uh, you know, in a non-accusatory way, do you sometimes forget your medications? Do you have trouble remembering? 
Do you, you know, how do you feel when you take your medications? Um, do you stop it if you don't feel well? So all these things are real life because after the patients leave the office, they may just be taking your prescription and throwing it in the trash. So adherence uh, tools are sometimes valuable. I must say that sometimes it's the family members who, uh, who, who care so much for the patient who will tell me the truth, even if the patient isn't going to. I do people have, we talked a bit about white coat hypertension. Um, there are these ambulatory blood pressure monitors that have gradually been come down in price in cardiology offices, in, Medicaid, in medical offices. It's often used as a tiebreaker <laughs> that if the patient says, I'm good at home, but you're high in the office, you don't want it to turn into a um, an, an argument between you and the patient. And I'll say, how about if we just get a tiebreaker to see what's happening in real life? So again, home is where the heart is. Would you believe I've really almost, I've al almost gotten to the point where I discard um, a patient's office blood pressure and I give every hypertensive patient this very simple log that can be downloaded from the web where they're now enrolled into measuring their blood pressure. So it's not the doctor's job to get the blood pressure down, but if the patient is measuring their blood pressure, even a couple of times a week and writing it down and bringing it into you, they know now that they're part of the care team to get their blood pressure down. These are some of the patterns that I can see in ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. This is classic that people, the orange line here, people dip with high blood pressure and then may rise later in the day and get this morning surge. I hope I didn't just mess up my slide. There we are. Um, this is a more on the right is a, these non-dippers in green. People as CKD, their blood pressure may not fall and they're at increased cardiovascular risk or even reverse dippers. On the right panel, you can see that this patient's blood pressure is really the in black, it's the top black, it's the systolic pressure and the bottom of the black curve, the diastolic, whereas the red line is the heart rate. And you can see this patient is clearly a non-dipper, that the patient's blood pressure is high day and night and not really coming down. So these people might benefit from both morning and evening doses of medications. So I realized I'm kind of contradicting what I said before about once a day dosing of medications, but for people who are non-dippers, there may be value to dosing their medication twice a day to try to tur essentially turn them into dippers to bring that blood pressure down at night. And it's been shown by some nice studies in Spain that if you can achieve a dipping phenotype, you do improve cardiovascular uh, event. So we're in the home stretch here. Just a few more points to make. Um, what are some guidelines to improve adherence to therapy? A lot of these are fairly intuitive. To look for uh, signals of non-adherence that the patient, do they know their medications? What will the family tell you? Um, as a person who is on a beta blocker but has a heart rate of, you know, 95, um, it's uh, there are all different signals to look for adherence. If they don't know what foods are low in sodium, I tell every patient what I want their blood pressure to be at home so that when they're measuring it, they know that we want the systolic blood pressure 130 or lower. To try to be encouraging, I try to not be critical and make the you know have, make people feel bad, but I tell them that they you know I highlight that they want to be there for their grandchildren, um, and that they really can do it. 
I tell people about, you know, the, the risks of high blood pressure. You bring them in frequently. We talk about lifestyle. Try to keep, it's easier said than done sometimes, but keep care simple and inexpensive. So there are lots of tools. Some pharmacies will create blister packs, little bubbles where people can just pop out all of their medications. And they tie this with events in their day, like when I brush my teeth, when I eat my breakfast, I'll take my blood pressure meds, which I think is a nice intro. So enrolling family members, using phone uh, or smartwatch supports. Here in the US, we sometimes even have the ability to check in with the pharmacy to see if the patient's actually getting their prescriptions refilled. Things that are very simple, using pill boxes. I tell people, uh, you know, instead of getting an ugly hat for uh, Christmas or for their birthday, maybe the family can get them a home blood pressure monitor. Just continuing on with this, I use, I integrate it into their lives, use long acting agents, consider using nurses as assistants to help you with management, even if you're overextended, to assign nurses to check in. Um, try a new approach if the current, if, if it's really not working, uh, you know, you, maybe you can sort of uh, flip the script, as we say here in the US. and try to see why they're failing. Is it, a, is it erectile dysfunction? Is it fatigue? Is it urinary frequency? Try to get to the bottom of why we're not achieving it. Empathy really does help. So if you're not an empathetic person, try to fake it. And it's, a, it's sort of a joke, but um, most of us are very empathic, but uh, for that individual, they really do need the support. And if they feel that the caregiver really cares, that they, they want to, um, not just for themselves, but they realize that you really do care about them and that they'll uh, try harder. So finishing up, uh, just to a one, again, one very uh, controversial idea. <clears throat> I get a call. We have a patient that needs discharge from the hospital today. I need recommendations for blood pressure meds so they can get out of the hospital. It's a 67-year-old obese diabetic woman with uh, a stage 3B chronic kidney disease, hypothyroidism. In the hospital, her blood pressure has been quite elevated. These are the medications. She's on four meds, including metformin. And those were the outpatient meds. She's having some pain. She has some nausea, it's trace edema. So you discuss it with your attempt. What should you do besides stopping the metformin because of the advanced chronic kidney disease? Should we increase the amlodipine? Should we ch uh, add chlorthalidone um, because the patient needs a diuretic? Should we add an SGLT2 inhibitor because they're diabetic? Um, should we change them to a stronger acting diuretic because they have CKD or do nothing? This is not one of your CME questions because it's quite difficult, but here in the home stretch, I just wanna show you some controversial data that many of us will intensify blood pressure medication in the hospital or were called because we want to make sure the person doesn't have a heart attack or a stroke, you know, on our watch. This is a study from 2019 that compared older adults uh, who had their blood pressure medication intensified in the hospital or left alone. And you can see on the left panel in the intensified group they were more likely to be readmitted <clears throat> um, if their medications were adjusted upward in the hospital. Under serious adverse events, they were more likely to have adverse events um, if the medications were increased in the hospital. This is a follow-up. Uh, that's the same. Yes, yeah, so that's the same thing. 
even a repeat study looking at, this is retrospectively looking at tw almost 23,000 people admitted for non-cardiac disease. I would sort of suggest that cardiac patients may be different and maybe should have their blood pressure meds adjusted. But they looked, excuse me, at older people, at a subset of 60, almost 6,000 people who had blood pressure left at 150 or treated because it was 160. And interestingly, the treated group had more acute kidney injury, more myocardial infarction here at 1.2% versus 0.6. Even following up the patient for a year later, the adding more blood pressure medications based upon the hospital hypertension did not lead to fewer cardiovascular events. Sometimes people say, well, I better increase the medicines now because I don't know when they're gonna get follow-up after this hospitalization. But the data to, the, the evidence to support, so this patient who I described had some pain, had some nausea, they were in the hospital, so possibly sleeping poorly. All of these can raise blood pressure. So even if this is some of the data from, they looked at this composite endpoint for rehospitalization, heart attack, stroke, but in no category, regardless of if it was mild, moderate, or severe hypertension, in no group did increasing the medication in the hospital do better. So all of us have our, um, our number that they we feel that we have to adjust the blood pressure medications, including myself. But I just want to sort of uh, lend a thought out there that there really doesn't have to be this push to keep low to keep adjusting antihypertensive medications in the hospital because there's no data that it leads to better clinical outcomes in a non-cardiac population. So my take home points here, home monitoring, low pill burden, long half-life of meds, frequent follow-up if your patient's poorly controlled, that diuretics are great drugs, uh, especially for a high salt intake population. And I look for, I, I found this beautiful picture that you guys are all probably aware of, of, um, of in Ethiopian capital. And, uh, you know, I really, really I'm going to say again, I really appreciate your allowing me the opportunity to speak to your auspicious group about such an important topic. Please uh, reach out to me. I left my email address on the first slide. It's just uh, jesse.goldman at jefferson.edu or jessegoldman at gmail. So I, I really look forward to hearing about some of the questions from you all. But thank you very much again. Thank you so much. It was an excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, I was also learning a lot, taking some notes. You had a, you have a lot of questions and uh, question and answer. So they've been engaged and very good feedback on the, you can, you can check them on the chat box. Everybody is very, excited and happy about the talk. So Fitzum, should I read the questions or do you want to read them? I, I can read them and then we, we can make. So I, I start from the top. So what is the maximum dose of enalapurine? Should I prescribe it daily or twice a day? Then the, the name is not there. It's an anonymous attendee. Okay. So, you know, enalapril is a, uh, it's an interesting medication because it's an ACE inhibitor. It has a long half-life and it's even, I believe it's given as enalapril 8 that gets metabolized to enalapril. Or, uh, but, you know, for me, the, it's, uh, you know, at first I wouldn't believe anything I say more than your own ability to Google things. But, uh, you know, I'll go up to, you know, I usually don't go above 40, so it's a good medication. Um, you can dose it either once or twice a day. Personally, I do tend to dose it once a day because I do believe adherence is better. Many patients tell me they fall asleep 
uh, before they get to take their second dose of antihypertensive meds. I tend to not go above 40 milligrams. Very rarely I have seen dose as high as 80 milligrams, 40 and 40, but you're not gonna get much additional benefit going from 40 to 80 milligrams. Um, you know, it's a nice point. I, I don't want to be too long winded. I see there are lots of questions, but um, the one reason to push an allopril doses higher is if I'm trying to get urinary protein levels down. Thank you. So Dr. Getacho have a question if you have any preference between hydrochlorotazide or chlorotazidone. Yeah, great question. So, you know, the... Uh, there were there were set there are several small studies or moderately sized studies suggesting that um, chlorothalidone is superior to hydrochlorothiazide again because of half life and you know as happens so often in medicine you every half of maybe sometimes more than half of what you know to be true turns out to be false because there is a recently completed large um, Veterans Administration study, at least suggesting that there's no additional benefit of chlorothalidone over hydrochlorothiazide. So, uh, so just as the, the, uh, the question suggests, up until very recently, I would often change people from HCTZ to to chlorthalidone because of this half-life issue. I, I still do it um, because I do, it's the same dosing at, you know, 12 and a half or 25 milligrams. There's been a suggestion that you may get a little bit more hypokalemia with chlorthalidone than with hydrochlorothiazide. Um, I still do it, but I'm not quite, I'm not a hundred percent as sure of it as I used to be, ask me again in a year from now when this Veterans Administration study is published. Great question. Uh, next one is going to ask you to choose size between the European and the American guideline. Dr. Watson is asking how, how, how low shall we treat the European advice not to go below 120? Right. So, um, you know, I think it's, I, I really do enjoy the controversy because I think, you know, it's, I, I'm not, so I do think that they both make very good points. Um, when I think it's a, a reliable patient who can get blood tests, um, then I do, I do try to keep the systolic blood pressure more in the high 120s to low 130s. As a nephrologist, I do see plenty of acute kidney injury when the systolic blood pressure is getting down below 120. So if it's a, a reliable patient who's going to get blood pressure, excuse me, blood tests regularly, I do try to, you know, I, so again, for home measurements, I'm not trying to get their systolic below 120. Um, it's really mainly just for, for office measurement. So for home, I am trying to get them high 120s, low 130s. If it's someone who's particularly frail or at risk of uh, syncope or who won't come in for blood tests periodically, I, I would try to, I would follow the European guidelines. I know that's not a, a totally straightforward answer. Everybody wants simple, straightforward answers. I don't think you have to it, you really, even if you're, you don't have to get people below 120, but it, you know, I think sometimes if you're shooting for 120 and you achieve, you know, 130, you're doing pretty well. But sometimes if you're shooting for 130 and you get 140, then the patient clearly has room for improvement. I hope I answered that adequately. I am mute. I was dropping. Uh, another good question from Dr. Gitachos: Morning or evening dose preferred? So it's a, another. You guys asking great questions. So uh, I I I prescribe morning for people without CKD. 
I give morning antihypertensive meds because blood pressure is rising during the day. Um, that, you know, if your goal is to get the blood pressure down during the day, then I, it's, I wanna give it in the morning when blood pressure is gonna be highest throughout the day. For people who have chronic kidney disease, as I mentioned, I will try to space it out to cover their, because there is a risk of them being non-dippers. So I do wanna cover them throughout the nighttime period. For people who are intolerant of daytime dosing, you know, who are complaining of uh, daytime fatigue, um, then sh sure, yes, I will advocate for evening doses. But if I have my choice, morning. A personal question for me regarding, do you have any specific choice which class of antihypertensive you put in the morning and which ones you put at nighttime if you have to divide the medications? Yeah, so uh, for people who, you know, who, who I, again, I try to avoid diuretics at bedtime. So it can be tricky, Fitzum, because let's say the person's, um, if they take their diuretic, but then they're going out of the house to work, they often don't want to be searching for a restroom um, while they're on their way to work. So I, I, try to, if I, I try to get people to take diuretics first thing in the morning, and then by the time they're getting ready to leave the house, maybe some of the effect has worn off, or I have them take their diuretic dose when they first get back home from work. Um, in terms of nighttime dosing, you know, I'll certainly, uh, you know, I tend to use things that are, I'll give sed uh, sedating medications. So if they happen to be on oral clonidine or tamsulosin for, um, or doxazosin, for benign prostatic hypertrophy, that causes some sedation. I will give those in the evening as well. Um, but otherwise, if patients are on long-acting calcium channel blockers or RAS blockers, you know, those I will tend to give in the mornings as well. Next question. Um, is it indicated to discontinue antihypertensive medication in a young patient? on single pill with the lowest dose having controlled blood pressure for a year and above? It's a great, another, you got, I, I'm, I'm gonna stop saying great question because I, I haven't heard a bad one yet. Um, so it's a great point that if, pers if a, let's say if, if a young person has been committed to an antihypertensive regimen and they have many years of life left, I think it is, and they have no evidence of end organ damage. It is prudent to hold the medication and see if they're still hypertensive. Uh, you know, a lot of times the patients will do this on their own, that they'll uh, quote unquote forget uh, or not get to the pharmacy in time for a refill. But often patients will sort of trial because they have the same thought as as you, they don't, they don't know if they still need medication for the rest of their life. But yeah, I would agree if it's a young person, <clears throat> you know, young people tend to have much more uh, volatile, variable blood pressure. And sometimes people get committed to blood pressure medications and either they've started exercising more or lost weight. Um, or stop smoking, that they may no longer need those blood pressure medications. And you don't have to wait till they're hypotensive before you stop it. So I think um, holding it in a young person who's low risk is really quite reasonable. Any preference between S inhibitors and or ARBs? Question from Dr. Gitachon. So again, I do tend, you know, it, it's uh, if you have some of the same issues as me, it's a lot of it, it's about cost and coverage of the medication. So it doesn't help if I choose the, you know, the longest acting ARB, meaning micardis my, my or telmisartan, if the patient can't get it. So I do try, so 
if, but if the, if all other things being equal, I'll, you know, what, what better endorsement than to tell you what I give my hypertensive mother. So, because it's longest, so my card is, I don't, I'm not a speaker for the company. I don't get an honorarium from them, but the longest acting ARBs, ARBs being Mycardus Telmasartan or Benicar, which is uh, Olmasartan. In terms of the ACE inhibitors, as one of the previous, I do tend to prefer lisinopril and enalapril or ramipril that all have long half-lives because if the patient's going to take it, you want it to, um, you, you want it to cover them throughout the course of the day. By the way, uh, tennis, the link for the uh, quizzes have already been uh, shared on the on the link. You, you will have time to fill them out. I don't want you to miss to listen to the question and answer session, but we'll give you some time to answer those. So, but it's already been shared. Um, so another great question. If you have a patient that you're managing with lifestyle modification, how long would you wait before starting them on medications? Yeah, this is a, a this is sort of a it's a great real world question because you know sometimes patients that you really like they say I'm going to exercise and then they come back in three months and they say oh no I'm really going to exercise now and you know at some point you have to put your foot down so the the recommendations are four months four months of lifestyle modification. And if they're not at target, um, then uh, then you're going to shift gears and start, you know, leaning towards medication. The question about um, renal denervation. Any role still on that? Right. So would you? So I was I was the principal, and as I might have mentioned, I was a principal investigator on a renal denervation study, um, and I was part of a, a conference call as recently as yesterday about renal denervation. So it's and again, it's been it's caught on much more in Europe than it has in the United States. Um, so. The uh, I don't know if it's available in Ethiopia or not. Um, the pro the only issue about renal denervation. So there are pros and cons like everything in life. The, you know it, some of the initial try. So the renal denervation for people who aren't familiar with it, that in the in the catheterization laboratory, a cardiologist or an interventional radiologist passes a a catheter into the renal arteries, and there are sympathetic afferents and efferents that carry signals back and forth to the kidney. It's not the entire uh, story clearly in hypertensive, but by ablating these nerves with a catheter, the procedure seems short, not painful, and without much risk at all, you can get a meaningful sustained blood pressure reduction, sustained even out to three years that we know so far, of somewhere between six and 10 millimeters of mercury systolic. So I don't know if that's a glass half full or half empty. It's not gonna turn you know, it's not going to turn the majority of your, it's not going to quote unquote cure the hypertension in the majority of your patients. But I think there is a role for people who say have resistant hypertension and you can't control them on three or four meds that and just don't want to take, you know, what are you going to put them on, you know, a handful of pills? So we know that a six to 10 millimeter reduction in blood pressure is clinically meaningful. It's not gonna be the, it's not gonna, it's not a 20 millimeter 
difference, but I think there clearly will be populations of people who it benefits from, like people who can't afford medications or people who are not severely non-adherent, just can't be trusted. For people who are hypertensive and you, they just don't want to take their first blood pressure medication, maybe that'll give them a few more years. With, so to me, it's the target populations who I'm interested in renal denervation for are people with resistant hypertension, the non-adherent, the underserved because of lack of access, or for people with, you know, very minimal, mild, sustained hypertension who just don't want to take their first medication. It's unclear in the United States what the cost of it will be. And here in the US, there have been several competing catheter types, and the FDA, the is the FDA is expected to rule on what they'll pay for renal denervation this coming August. So we're all waiting for that data, or that not that data, but that recommendation. Is there a time where you would start two medication at the same time, like from the get go? That's from Dr. Nibusay. Yeah, so uh, so it is recommended by the American Heart Association uh, that I think if your systolic blood pressure is above 160, it's, you know, there's no single medication that's going to get that patient to target. So the recommendations are to start a, a combination agent like lisinopril HCT if your systolic is greater than. 150 to 160. I think is, you know, what's implicit in that question is um, I'm often reluctant to do that because if the patient has a side effect, if they take a combo agent and then they become dizzy or lightheaded, then they'll become distrustful of your therapy. So the, the recommendations are out there to start two meds above 150, 160. But again, in real life, I'm often reluctant. I'll often start one, either a RAS. So this is an example of the, the, the guidelines are often different. You know, none of us follow the guidelines 100%, but the speaker is highlighting something that I'm aware of, but don't really do in real life. Because if I put someone on a combo and they drop to 130 and they're dizzy, then I have to, it's going to take a lot of time for them to unwind that and trust me again. I'm more likely to start one and bring them back soon. What do you do, Fitzum? I, I completely agree with you. Like starting two medication always worries me. Something happens, all of the labs, side effects. I wouldn't know which one causes. So always start with one and go from there. And you need to have them, I think, for a few visits to make sure, like, you know, that the patients also could be a one day thing too. So start with one. See them on the follow-up visit, home blood pressure trends. Yeah, so I think on this, you, again, I, I may, I'm glad that I get this opportunity to bring up this point. You know, the guidelines are only guidelines. That you, no one's going to be. They're 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 intended to help physicians practice in a more uniform way. No one's going to be faulted or brought to or sued because they didn't follow a particular guideline. Um, no one's going to tell you that you're a bad healthcare professional because you didn't follow the guideline, as long as you have a rationale for doing what you're doing. Uh, we're taking too much. Time on the question, but they're very, very good questions. So I hope we're not taking too much of your time, Dr. Goldman. No, I'm enjoying it. I hope you guys, I hope I'm not being too long winded. I'll try to give shorter answers. 
this this has been very helpful from the uh, chat message that I'm seeing. They're, they're loving the presentation and the discussion. Um, very good question from Dr. Uh, Armonium. He, he's uh, wondering the risks of um, uh, renal side effects we're using S and ARPS while trying to maximize hypertension control. So we certainly, so first, you know, we know that the combination of ACE and ARB should be avoided. That the, there's a, again, a, I think it was the, the world after all hat being the largest, the second largest blood pressure trial was called on target. And it was a combination of Ramipril um, and Telmasartan, either as single agents or in combination. Again, published in the Journal of Medicine, I want to say about 2017 or so, uh, where they found that the combo of ACE and ARBs did not lead to any improved cardiovascular benefit, but you did get more acute kidney injury, more syncope, more hyperkalemia. Um, you know, the, certainly for um, you, you know, we, it, it, as fit as Dr. Halmeri and I are nephrologists, you know, we, ex, we, we actually, we know that if the creatinine rises on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, it's actually a good thing. So just to be, let's say you had a patient with a creatinine of 1.7 and it rose to 2.2 on an, on lisinopril, and the um, someone panics that they're that the patient has renal artery stenosis. You're going to put them on dialysis. So they lower the lisinopril until the creatinine comes back to 1.7. So I like this example because it, the 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 uh, the non nephrologist has found is congratulating themselves because they're giving an ACE inhibitor to protect the kidneys and treat the high blood pressure. Um, but the nephrologist thinks you found the dose that is, is now doing nothing to protect the kidneys. So when you're lowering intraglomerular pressure with an ACE inhibitor, you expect the creatinine to rise. You want it to rise. In ACE inhibitor and ARB trials, we know that if the creatinine doesn't rise at all, those patients are not getting renal protection. I know this is a controversial topic. The National Kidney Foundation says, the, and I can say that the, the GFR can fall by up to 30% and that's still completely acceptable. I was a principal investigator in the CARL trial, which was cardiovascular outcomes in renal atherosclerotic lesions, where people with known renal artery stenosis, a thousand patients with known renal artery stenosis got a long-acting ARB, candesartan, Zero people went on dialysis because of the precipitation of renal failure. So nobody really, even though we stop ACE inhibitors in acute kidney injury, because we want to make sure there's nothing left contributing, I would be brave in using RAS blockers for hypertension because nobody winds up on dialysis and you want the creatinine to rise a little bit. Thank you. The questions are actually very interesting. Uh, I'll go back to the question with Dr. Abdullah, but Dr. Abdusalam is asking if there is a contraindication to use hydrochlorotazide regarding GFR or creatinine, maybe in general, diuretics use and... Uh, so I would say that once your GFR gets below 60 or 45, it's unlikely that you're going to get much benefit from a thiazide diuretic. Now, with that said, uh, Fitzum here knows that we just had Journal Club a few months ago that showed that the addition of a thiazide 
to a loop diuretic in people with CKD who had GFRs down 30 and 20 did lead to no um, renal injury and some improvement in blood pressure. So again, every, I used to stop thiazides once the GFR got below 45%, but I no longer do that because we know that a long acting thiazide like chlorthalidone or metalazone does seem to help the loop diuretic work with sodium excretion. So again, uh, we're all of us, we're lifetime learners and um, things that we used to, we pretend that we never, you know, that, that we uh, we do what we always did. But um, I, I would phrase it a little differently. I'd say that once the GFR gets below 45, I have a strong suspicion that a person's going to need a loop diuretic. Um, I would not just rely upon a thiazide to get the job done. A few more questions. One is about a young patient, that kind of similar case we discussed earlier, but the blood pressure is a bit higher. 20, some 20 years, between 20 to 30 years of age, blood pressure between 150 to 160 systolic. Um, do I still need to calculate the 10-year cardiovascular risk or given that the blood pressure is high enough already, you have to start him on medications? Yeah, so certainly no one would fault you for starting medication in a hypertensive person. You know, the risk calculator is valuable for showing you that you really, it's not an emergency, the person's not about to walk out of your office and have a stroke or have a myocardial infarction. Um, that, you know, their risk is not zero. Um, and, uh, you know, if I had a person even, so I'm not saying that you shouldn't treat this person, but there is opportunity to watch and wait and see if there are other identifiable risk factors like anxiety. You know, we've been, I was actually listening to a, a curbsiders, a medical podcast where they had one of my colleagues on as a, a speaker and they made the point that anxiety and stress is a common cause of hypertension. And there doesn't have to be this rush to treat the hypertension. So if you're asking me, is, is there any, is there one number that I would automatic, we all have, you know, whether or not it was 180 or 190, there certainly is a blood pressure number, even in a young person with low risk that I'll go ahead and treat it. But I think it's reassuring to see that their cardiovascular risk is not at all high as compared to, say, someone my age with my body mass index who would certainly be at higher risk. And I would not, uh, I would be uh, not willing to wait long before treating their blood pressure. I almost forgot a very good question from Dr. Anonymous. Um, controlled systolic blood pressure very well with a combination of medication, but the diastolic is still high. How do you treat diastolic hypertension? Yeah, so it's a, I think, I'm not sure if you guys have the same issue in Ethiopia. Uh, it, it, the, the problem with blood, for the population, they, some people want to tell me it's the systolic pressure, some people it's diastolic pressure. And the idea is that younger people tend to have diastolic hypertension, that because their blood, it's not something we talked about at all this time, but young people who have, you know, really very um, uh, elastic and contractile blood vessels, their blood pressure tends to show up in diastole, whereas as people become middle-aged, both systolic and diastolic pressure um, are elevated. And then among the elderly, systolic pressure hypertension predominate, predominates. As blood vessels get stiffer, most of the energy from the cardiac contraction shows up in systole. 
So, um, you, you know, this we, we used to talk about, we still talk sometimes about J point, but especially in a younger person, I would be aggressive in treating diastolic hypertension. Um, patients often want to tell you uh, the good news. They say they don't, they, you know, just to digress a little bit, they say my pressure is 150 over 70 and that fifth, that 70 is great. Or they tell me that my, my pressure is 115 over 92 and that 115 is great. So I agree, the patients will often, don't want to take medication and will try to accentuate the good number. But I, I do, especially in younger people, I would be vigilant in treating diastolic hypertension. The unfortunate part is we don't have any medications that preferentially treat either systolic or diastolic blood pressure. Um, so, you know, again, talking about the elderly, I'm, I'm often willing to tolerate a low diastolic pressure, you know, even in the 40s to try to get that systolic pressure down to the 130s. Um, but it, uh, and it, I still don't know, nobody really knows what to do with an older person who has an elevated, diast isolated diastolic pressure. There, it's a it's a rare individual. I don't think anyone knows how to manage them specifically. Uh, so, use of HCTZ in patients with diabetes, I think, regarding, yeah. So again, it used to be said that uh, if you gave a, a, a diabetic a diuretic, that you would worsen glucose intolerance and you might worsen their, um, their chance of cardiovascular events. That was kind of put to, to rest with um, All Hat, where in All Hat, granted they used chlorothalidone instead of hydrochlorothiazide, but even among diabetics getting thiazides, they found that those patients did just as well as someone on a, a long acting calcium channel blocker or a uh, an ACE inhibitor giving a diabetic a thiazide. So they there was no signal for worse outcomes. So there might be fear and reason to, you know, the, the time when I will, you know, question it myself is if somebody has very, very mild diabetes, and if I'm afraid that the thiazide is pushing them onto being a di diabetic, then I may avoid thiazides. But if it's someone who's already, you know, clearly established as a diabetic, they do just as well on a thiazide. About digital versus manual blood pressure at home, I think the manual requires training, right? Do you have any preference on that? Like, do you, do you have any patients who do the manual? Oh, you mean using a stethoscope? A stethoscope, yeah. I think that's what I understood. The question from Dr. Shimedlis is asking if I see. Purposes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's uh, this question comes up sometimes, like if they have a daughter who's a nurse and the nurse is going to check it. It might be disappointing for the audience to hear, but... Um, Automated blood pressure monitoring seems to be more accurate than relying upon human blood pressure measurement because um, the electronic device is not prone to rounding errors. Um, they don't get distracted by the cell phone going off. They not, they really, they always have a, uh, there's never any question. It's not saying, was that the first heart sound or not? So uh, the only, the, uh, my only criticism would be, I would tr I try to avoid wrist monitors if I can, but for people who are really quite obese and they can't get a cuff that fits their upper arm, I'll take a, uh, um, 
I'll take either a manual blood pressure with a large cuff if available, or use a wrist monitor for that individual. The only other thing I would say is that, again, you can Google the, uh, I think there, there's a European society and an American society that review reliability of blood pressure monitors. So if the patient, you know, because not all monitors are the same. So I, I tend to prefer um, automatic monitors over, um, over uh, manual because, you know, the, the patient can do it themselves. They don't have to rely upon another person. Um, and it's eliminating a lot of sources of error. Perfect. I think we're almost wrapping up the questions. I hope, attendees, you have enough time to fill out the quizzes. We'll finally do those, some of the questions, four questions we have. There's actually one interesting question in the chat box, not on the Q&A. Uh, it's talking about Losartan. We mentioned it's only half half life of two hours. Uh, but uh, I don't know who forwarded the question, but it says it's onset is six hours has got more potent active metabolites and duration is usually longer. And we consider it as a good alternative. I think I understand this question because the access to different types of ACE and RBC is limited. Losartan is widely available in Ethiopia. And we consider it's a long acting because of its metabolites. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, I get, the way I usually get this question is I will see some physicians prescribe Losartan as, as twice daily dosing. And that's not unreasonable. So I would agree that there are metabolites. It's unclear how active the metabolites are. Um, you know, the, uh, the Merck, I think it's, well, I think Losartan is generic now. It was initially made by Merck. Uh, and it's been, physicians are familiar. I guess I look at it that if, if you have an ability to use a longer acting agent, if you can get it, then why not use it? Um, because, you know, even cardiologists love Valsartan because of the value and Val Heft trial. But if I have a choice between um, a, a, a medicine that's, you know, has a short half-life and maybe the metabolites help or a medication that I know has a long half-life, I'll choose the one that I know is effective and has a long half-life. Okay, I think it's almost all the questions we have. Dr. Antenna raised a very good question finally. Where can we get a good blood pressure monitor? And he said, can we use the one, the wrist blood pressure monitors? How reliable are they? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Amazon sells blood pressure monitors. And I tell, uh, I tell people, you don't need the fanciest blood pressure monitor with a big memory or bells and whistles. You know, uh, you know I, again, I don't speak for this particular company, not, and I don't get an honorarium from them, but uh, Omron, O-M-R-O. O N Omron, they've been producing um, home blood pressure monitors for decades. They're validated externally by medical societies that deem them reliable. Um, I would not use there. There are actually even some blood pressure monitors that go on people's fingers. I would not use those. Um, it, one interesting thing I would put aside is that, uh, interestingly, wrist blood pressure is slightly higher than brachial artery pressure. Some people might expect that because it's further from the heart, that the blood pressure would be lower. But if you're at a, you know, the wrist blood pressures, you know, by arterial measurement seems to be even about three to five millimeters higher than brachial. So if you are going to use a wrist monitor um, that you could even knock off a couple of points and say, well, that's approximately equal to brachial artery pressure. The only caveat that is if the person has severe peripheral artery disease, you may end up with an, you may end up 
you know, blunting some of the blood pressure if they happen to have stenosis, you know, in their radial arteries. Perfect. I think we have addressed almost all the questions. And I think attendees, Ezra, you can tell me if uh, you've closed the uh, form already so that we can discuss the questions or we can give them more time. Well, we have 89 in attendee and we have around 80 response. Okay. I think there's only one question that we didn't answer. Blood pressure goals for are those different now for patients with diabetes uh, or CKD, or we have the same standard goal for everyone? It's a great question. So for diabetes, the same for chronic kid. It, it, it's tricky that because, you know, these societies are very cautious in making, they make guidelines, targets based upon the data that's available. So for instance, the study that I showed, the SPRINT trial, did not really, in, it was not a CKD study, it was a hypertension study. So there have not, there have really has not been a large validated study for blood pressure targets in chronic kidney disease. So they can say down to 130 systolic um, and diastolic 85, we have data for there. We don't have any CKD data for blood pressure targets below that. In diabetics, we do have some better data from the ACCOMPLISH study. Um, and in ACCOMPLISH, we do know that lower blood pressure down to systolics in the you know, mid-120s did, did lead to better clinical outcomes. Uh, I think you can close the form now and we can discuss, I think, the questions that we have. And th they were still asking about the last case you presented, um, the patient was in the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the message was not understood. They're still asking, what do we do on those cases? Yeah. So what do you do if a person's hypertensive in the hospital? Then you see them, uh, at, again, uh, you see them in the office within a few weeks as best you can. Again, I was, tr the uh, sometimes, you know, nurses will call. I certainly remember a million years ago being a, a resident, being hounded that the patient's blood pressure is high and what are you gonna do about it? Yeah. Um, and I think we all get trained in that way that we have to do something but this, there was really very little data until recently about what to do. You know, you could, you could treat, uh, you know, I, I see a lot more. I see acute renal failure and wor worsening CVAs with too aggressive blood pressure medication management. I don't see, you know, I've been treating as fits and I've been treating people in the hospital now for you know, more than 30 years. And I never see people have strokes in the hospital or develop MIs in the hospital because their blood pressure was inadequately treated. So I would say that if it is severe, sure, I'll give them a little extra something, but I won't keep adjusting the medication every few days. And if it's mild to moderately elevated, I'll just watch it and have them follow it up in the office within a couple of weeks. Thank you so much. I think we have addressed all the questions. We can go to the questions we had. So I think the form is closed. We can wrap it up with that. Okay. So I will be oh. sharing the screen. Uh, uh, I, I think Dr. Goldman has it, right, on, on your side? Either way is fine. Okay, either way, okay. So should I stop sharing or? No, no, proceed. You, you can, we can go ahead and discuss. All right, they're answering. You can share your answers on the chat box, so they're sending them. Most people are saying B.
So should I, you let me know when I can talk, Fitz? Um, yeah, yes, yes, you can proceed, yeah. I'll okay, so yes, B is the correct answer. As I mentioned in the talk, that people with um, low plasma renin activity are salt sensitive. And even if they don't have edema or JVD, they're, they're physiologically acting as though they're mildly volume overloaded. And people who are mildly volume overloaded and hypertensive benefit from a diuretic. So B is correct. Perfect. Question number two. You can type in the answers again. Most are saying B, some A's. Okay. I think we can proceed, right? Okay, so mast hypertension is the opposite of white coat hypertension. Mast hypertension is when, you know, where people are able to relax in the office and bring their pressure and vasodilate themselves. Maybe they're good at meditating and they bring their blood pressure down. And yet in real life at home, the pressure is high. As I mentioned, people with mast hypertension are at increased cardiovascular risk. So this is valuable to checking blood pressure at home in almost everybody. Whereas white coat hypertension, it's gotten a lot more press is when the, pre, the, the, the red coat, excuse me, the white coat of the doctor is like waving a, a red flag in front of a bull that it makes their blood pressure high. So the correct answer is B, elevated at home, um, but uh, normal in the office. I think mask hypertension only happens when you have a great doctor like JC. They can be more relaxed in the office than at home. Uh, you kind of, it's, uh, I, I mean, again, just, you know, we're, we're all real doctors and, you know, it's someone I was saw somebody in the office yesterday who was blaming white coat hypertension. I wasn't wearing any white coat. All right. So great question number three is zero. Again, most people are saying B. We can, I think we can proceed. You know, when I wrote these questions, I wasn't trying to only choose B. I maybe I should have maybe I if I was smarter, I would have made it all as a trick. But yeah, it's B again. And good, you very attentive audience. Pressure naturesis is when the kidney is like when all that high blood pressure is hitting the kidney like a fire hose and forcing. Uh, sodium and water out. And if we get the blood pressure down, interestingly, urine frequency decreases. So B is correct again. You guys are doing fantastically well. Okay. And the last question is, Ron? Most people are saying E. And again, you guys have gotten a hundred. I think you. it's more that you guys are smarter than that I'm a great lecturer. You guys got a hundred percent. Yes, those are all effective in, uh, in helping improve blood pressure and getting your patient to target. Excellent. I think this has been a very uh, excellent session what was the discussion and the presentation was very good. I'd like to thank you, Jesse, for taking your time on a Saturday 
to give this interesting lecture to my colleagues and friends back home in Ethiopia. Uh, hypertension is uh, one of the common uh, conditions they manage and treat and follow. So I'm sure this has been a valuable uh, lecture for all of you. And then uh, I, I want to thank you again on behalf of my colleagues, yet now again, Ethiopian Society of Cardiology Professionals. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave the floor to Israel and uh, you can say a few words as well, Jesse. No, again, I enjoyed it immensely. I really appreciate the opportunity. And, uh, you know, I hope you guys will invite me back. And I do, I really hope to get to Ethiopia myself someday. Uh, we, would, we would certainly try to do that. In the meantime, I, I have to treat you some Ethiopian food. So, absolutely. I'm going to hold you to that, fit some 100%. <laughs> no, no problem. That will be done. Now, is this a restaurant or you're cooking or your wife is cooking? Uh, which one do you prefer? I don't think you want me to cook. So, maybe. Yeah, either you or the re your wife uh, or the restaurant. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll do at home. If you go to DC, maybe we'll, we'll try the restaurant. It's better at home for us here. Good. Me. I'm looking right. forward to it. Good job. Thanks, guys. I Thank really appreciate so it. Don't hesitate to reach out to me with questions. All right. For, for all of you, I have typed his email for you or I'll share it in the Telegram group. He will uh, share you any questions you have on the email. Thank you and have a good afternoon or good night. Ezra, do you have anything to say or we're good? Nothing more. Good night, everyone. All right. Thank you so much.